Namaste and welcome back to Om Dharma YouTube channel. This is chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita series. The links to the other chapters have been provided in the description box. In this video, we are going to give you a verse by verse explanation of chapter 6, which is Dhyan Yoga. So, watch the video till the end. Hit the like button if you like the video. Consider subscribing Om Dharma YouTube channel for receiving regular updates and don't forget to share the video with your loved ones. So, let's get started. In 6.1, Lord Krishna says, One who performs obligatory action without reliance upon results of action, that person is a monk as well as a yogi, not one who has renounced fire or action. Lord Krishna begins the sixth chapter titled Dhyan Yoga or Yoga of Meditation by redefining what is meant by a monk and a Dhyan Yogi or a meditator. He says that one who performs actions in the spirit of Karma Yoga is both a monk and a meditator. The meditator is not one who has given up his duties or actions who has run away from the world. Lord Krishna drives home the point with two examples. First, he says that one does not have to renounce fire in order to perform meditation. In the olden days, householders would maintain a sacrificial fire in their homes. Absence of the fire indicated renouncing the duties of the householder. In other words, Lord Krishna says that one does not have to give up their household duties for pursuing meditation. Second, one does not have to physically renounce action and retire to a monastery to meditate. The culmination of Karma Yoga is the loss of sense of doership. This is the qualification of a meditator. In the next verse, he says, In this manner, that which is called renunciation, know that to be the same as yoga, O Pandav. For without renunciation of desires, one cannot become a yogi. Lord Krishna further elaborates on the definition of a sannyasi or a monk in the shlok. He says that the karma yogi and sannyasi at their core are one and the same. One need not renounce the world in order to become a dhyan yogi or a meditator. All one needs to do is to follow the path of karma yoga diligently. Only when the tendency to create new desires or sankalp goes away, one can become a meditator. It is only when the mind of the seeker is free of sankalp does he become ready for meditation. Meditation can occur only when the mind is tranquil. Tranquility only occurs when the mind is rid of all desires. For instance, once we finally get an object that we were craving for a long time, our mind experiences tranquility. But that is only for a fraction of a second. This is caused due to a temporary cessation of desires and ends when new desire starts agitating in the mind. If one has reached an advanced stage in the spiritual journey where desires have gone down to a minimum, one becomes actionless automatically. We saw this in the fifth chapter, but if one still harbors desires, karma yoga is the means to slowly diminish desires through renouncing the result of action. So what needs to be renounced is attachment to results of action and not action itself. Further in uh, 6.3 he says, For that contemplative person who desires to ascend to yoga, action is said to be the means. For one who is established in yoga, tranquility is said to be the means. Now to understand this verse, let's first understand what is meant by a contemplative person. Most people in this world harbor the notion that worldly objects, people and situations yield happiness. The contemplative person is one who has spent enough time observing the world and has understood that notion to be false. He need not have retreated to the forest to contemplate on this. He knows from his daily life experience that the world cannot give joy. Such a person known as a Muni has the desire to go higher, ascend above the material world and it's called Aruruksho. So for such a Muni, there are two possibilities. The first one being that he is not established in Dhyan Yoga or meditation. His mind still harbors desires. His proportion of Sattva Gun is lower compared to Rajas and Tamas. For such a seeker, the only means to get established in meditation is Karma Yoga. 
Diligent observation of karma yoga will develop the qualities of discrimination and dispassion, which is vivek and vairagya, respectively, which will ultimately purge desires from the mind. The second possibility is that the muni, who has achieved a higher level of vivek and vairagya, his mind does not harbor desires due to the predominance of sattva. He only performs the bare minimum of actions that are in line with his obligatory duties. Such a person is called arud or elevated. For such a person, meditation will come naturally. All he has to do is follow the instructions given later in this chapter towards shama, which is quietening the mind. So in verse number 4, he says, When one does not find attachment in sense objects and in actions, when one has renounced all projections, at that time one is said to have been established in yoga. Lord Krishna now explains what the term yoga root really means in the shloka. He says that it refers to a person who no longer gets attracted to or attached to sense objects and actions. This happens because that person finds contentment within himself and does not need to rush out into the world. In other words, he does not have sankalpas. So far we have understood sankalp to mean desire. Now let us understand the deeper meaning of sankalp. As we have seen throughout the Gita, ignorance of our true self is the root cause of all our sorrows. Ignorance makes us think that we are incomplete. It causes desires that push the mind to go outward to seek happiness. This outward projection is called sankalp. Now, typically, sankalp is seen in the urge to give undue importance to objects and to actions. No matter how much we want to deny it, each one of us has a weakness for certain material object. We think that those objects will give us happiness, peace, security, stability, etc. But if we follow the path of karma yoga diligently, the undue importance we place on material objects slowly diminishes. As an example, compare the experience of a child walking in a toy store to that of an adult doing the same thing. The minute the child enters into the store, each object pulls the child towards itself. The pull is so strong that the child thinks that he cannot live without these toys. A multitude of desires get generated in his mind. He gets excited and restless. But if an adult walks into the toy store, he may very well appreciate the toys, but there is no urge or force that compels him to get attached to any of the toys. Once our outlook towards all objects of the world is like that of an adult in a toy store, we are fit for meditation. Similarly, we have a fascination towards performance of actions. But when we deeply examine our actions, we realize that most of these are performed because everyone else is doing it and because we think we will be left out of a group if we do not perform those actions. Many of us pursue educational and career paths by emulating what someone else has done. Another reason that we perform actions is for strengthening our ego, which is asmita. Our ego puffs up when we say, I did this. We forget that actions are part of nature, that they are happening of their own accord. A child eventually stops putting his finger in the fire, having burned it each time he puts it in. Similarly, our sankalp, our need to act for gaining objects, diminishes as the wisdom gained through the contemplation increases. When this wisdom dawns and we diminish our attachment to action and objects, we become yoga ruled or established in dhyana yoga. So further in 6.5 he says, uplift yourself by yourself. Do not depreciate yourself. For only you are your friend and only you are your enemy. Lord Krishna gives us a powerful message in the shlok. He says that in order to progress in the spiritual path, in fact any undertaking, we have to lift ourselves by our own efforts. We are our own friends. If we do so, and if we do not do, we become our own enemy. In other words, our success and failure is entirely in our own hands. No other person can help us or hurt us. In 6.6 he says, For one who has conquered oneself by oneself, only his own self is his friend. 
but for one who has not conquered oneself, it is only his own self that behaves in animosity like an enemy. As further elaboration on the previous shlok, Lord Krishna explains exactly what he means by the statement we are our own friend and we are our own enemy. He says that for the person that has used his intellect to conquer the mind and senses, he becomes his own friend. But for one who is unable to conquer the mind and senses, he becomes his own enemy. So the message is clear. Progress towards meditation is not possible unless we use Karma Yoga to bring our mind under control and eliminate as many desires as possible. The world for us comprises of three aspects. Situations that we encounter, objects that we use, and people that we interact with. In the next three shlokas, Lord Krishna takes up each aspect and paints a picture of the meditator's attitude towards each of these aspects. So in 6.7 he says, One who has conquered himself, that serene person is steadfast in the Supreme Self, in cold and heat, in joy and sorrow, in praise and insult. Here Lord Krishna tackles the meditator's outlook towards situations. He said that the meditator who has won over his senses and mind, won over his lower nature, his mind remains well established in the eternal essence all the time. No matter what situation he finds himself in, his mind remains even calm and peaceful. In this shloka, remaining the same in cold and hard refers to pleasant and unpleasant situations experienced at the physical body level. Joy and sorrow and experienced emotions at the mind level. Praise and insult are experienced either as boosters or blows to the ego. They are experienced at the intellect level. The body, mind and intellect are part of nature or prakriti. They react to situational changes which also happens in prakriti. So therefore the one who knows that situations can only impact the body, mind and intellect but not his self, he remains peaceful in all situations. In the next verse he says, One whose self is content with knowledge and wisdom, who is steady like an anvil, who has conquered the senses, such a person called an established yogi, to him a lump of clay, a stone and gold are the same. Lord Krishna continues the explanation on the outlook of a realized meditator here. In the shlok, he speaks about how such a person responds to objects. This person's nature is complete and content with knowledge and wisdom. He has no need for anything else. This contentment and the mastery over senses gives him the quality of steadfastness. He is like an anvil in that regard. He sees sameness in a lump of clay, a stone and gold. Such is his uh, vision. Such a person is yukta or completely established in meditation. He has nothing further to do when it comes to meditation. Further, he elaborates on the qualities of a realized meditator in verse 6.9 and 6.10. And they read, Well-wishers, friends, enemies, the unbiased meditators, irritators, relatives, and also saints and sinners, one who views these as the same, is superior. The yogi should constantly engage in his self, establish himself alone in a solitary place, having subdued his mind and body without expectations, giving up all possessions. Lord Krishna now begins to describe the actual process of meditation and so in 6.11 he says, In a clean place, establish your stable seat that is not too high or low, with cloth deerskin and grass. Here he explains how to sit down and where to sit down for meditation. He says that the seat of meditation should be in a clean and pure place. It should not be too high or too low and should have sufficient insulation such as a cloth. Let us look at what it means by a clean place. The seat of meditation should be placed in a clean and pure location. Some places are naturally clean and pure and some can be cleaned through one's efforts. 
Anything that distracts us from meditation becomes an obstacle. If something is dirty or we are afraid that some insects are around, we cannot do meditation. Therefore, without a clean and pure place, meditation is not possible for beginners. Next, Lord Krishna says that the height of the seat should not be too high so that we are scared of falling down or too low that insects and other animals can bother us. It should be stable so that we are not distracted by the constant fear of falling down. Finally, Lord Krishna asks us to put cloth, deer skin, and kusha grass on the seat. What is meant here is that there should be a layer of insulation between our body and the seat. The seat could be very cold or hot, which could again become a distraction to the mind. So further in 6.12 he says, Seated on that seat, making the mind single-pointed, having subdued the activities of the mind and senses, engage in the yoga for purification of the self. Here he provides a comprehensive introduction to the process of meditation and also points out the goal of meditation. He says that the goal of meditation is to purify the intellect. The process to do that is by sitting down, controlling the mind and senses and focusing the mind, making it a single pointed focus. But this is easier said than done. Whenever we close our eyes and sit in meditation, the thoughts of the world rush in. Many techniques are given in the other literatures in order to make this happen, including concentrating attention on a point on the wall, on a flame, and so on. But the prerequisite to all of this is that we have to subdue the mind and senses. He continues to explain the posture one must assume while meditating in the next sloka. Holding the trunk, head and neck firm and steady, observing the tip of one's nose and not looking around. In 6.14 he says, One whose personality is calm, fearless and established in the vow of renunciation, with a restrained mind, the seeker should sit with his mind focused on me, regarding me as supreme. This shlok continues the topic of the method of meditation and he explains what should be the object of our meditation. He says, meditate upon me. He asks us for two things, to focus our mind on him and to regard him as the highest goal to be attained. The other prerequisite of a meditator is that the person should be calm, quiet and deep. Only when the seeker's mind becomes extremely quiet is meditation possible. The next requirement is that the meditator should be fearless. The biggest fear that the meditator harbors is that he will lose his worldly identity, that he will drop his worldly life. That is why the meditator has to have prepared himself, following the instructions given so far, to give up his individuality. Another way of looking at this is that we fear duality. We are scared to think that we are separate from other people, objects or situations. But one who has learned to see the sameness in everyone has eliminated this fear, because he sees himself in everyone. The meditator should be established with the vow of renunciation. Colloquially, the word brahmachari means celibate. Here it means one who casts off all rules and dons the role of a seeker when he sits for meditation. He has no other pursuits in mind no other rules in mind. In 6.15 he says, In this manner, the yogi who has subdued his mind, who always engages his self in me, attains ultimate liberation bearing peace, established in me. Here he speaks about the result or the fruit of meditation. He says that if meditation is followed as the technique prescribed here, it will bring us the ultimate peace. Only the eternal essence can give everlasting bliss and peace. Everything else gives temporary peace. Therefore, Lord Krishna urges the seeker to comprehend this fact and stop going after objects in the material world for happiness and peace. Further in 6.16, he says, This yoga is not for one who overeats nor for one who fasts. It is not for one who oversleeps nor for one who never sleeps at all. O Arjun. Here, Lord Krishna dispels many of these misconceptions by citing the examples. 
when we begin to think that we are progressing in meditation, we may begin to impose severe hardships on the body just because we have seen some others do it. Alternatively, we may go in the other direction and begin to neglect the body. In this regard, he advocates a balanced and moderate lifestyle towards achieving our spiritual goals. So in verse number 17, he says, One who has regulated his intake and movements, his conduct in action, his sleep and wakefulness, his sorrows are eliminated through yoga. Here he explains why is it important to have a balanced and a moderate lifestyle which is more or less self-explanatory. So in the next verse he says, When the controlled mind, indifferent towards all objects, is established only in the self, then such a person is called a yogi. Here he gives a way to evaluate ourselves with regards to attaining perfection in meditation. He says that only when one can establish the mind in the self and not in the material objects of the world is one fit to be called a meditator. Lord Krishna says that when the mind has gone beyond generating desires and cravings, only then does proper meditation happen. When the mind gets established in the self, at that time the person is considered as perfect, integrated and established in meditation. He is fit to be called a yogi. It will only happen with a very well firmly controlled mind which is pure and free from all kinds of cravings and desires. Further elaborating on the thought, Lord Krishna exemplifies in 6.19, just like a lamp in a windless place does not flicker. This state is comparable to the yogi having controlled the mind who engages his self in yoga. He compares the mind of a meditator to the flame of a lamp that is burning in a windless room. Just like the flame is unwavering due to the absence of wind, so too is the mind of a meditator steady due to absence of desire. When our focus and concentration reaches its peak, and when the target of meditation becomes our own Atma or Self, it is the culmination of meditation. It is the state of Samadhi. In 6.20 he says, When the mind is quietened through restraint by engaging in Yoga, and when beholding the Self in the Self, the Self is content. He says that the perfected meditator severs all connections of his mind with material objects and establishes a connection to the self or atma during meditation. When the connections with the material objects are severed, he achieves a level of satisfaction never achieved with material objects. The big difference here is that the satisfaction is from within and not from the outside world. When the mind has fully turned inward and has settled into the Atma or the Self, we experience a deep and lasting level of satisfaction and bliss. The only thought that remains is that I am the Atma or I am the eternal essence. All of the thoughts about the world, people, objects or situations have gone away. And that is how one can gain permanent happiness. 621 he says that infinite joy which is comprehended by the intellect but is beyond the senses when he experiences that state and is established in it he does not move away from his essence. Now he elaborates on the nature of that joy. He says that this joy is infinite and is comprehended only by the intellect. Also he says that once we are established in this joy no external circumstance will knock us or take us away from the state. Another characteristic of this joy is that it is beyond the comprehension of the senses. Now, Just like we cannot catch a satellite TV signal with a regular antenna, our senses cannot catch this joy. It is only comprehended by our intellect, which operates at a much higher level than our mind and senses. Just as an example, consider two teenagers who are at a party where everyone else is enjoying a cigarette. Both of them are offered a cigarette by their friends. The sense organs are reporting the same information to both the teenagers intellects. And that is the cigarette smoking is enjoyable and that all their friends are doing it. 
One teenager accepts the offer and takes a puff. But the other teenager has a refined intellect and it knows that this will only lead to sorrow in the end. In the same way, the intellect experiences joy that the senses cannot experience. He further goes on to say that once the perfected meditator realizes this self as his true nature, he will not feel the need to take on any other role or identification for the purpose of fulfillment. In verse number 6.22 he says, Having obtained his gain, he does not consider anything superior than that, established in which he cannot be agitated by the heaviest of sorrows. Elaborating further on the joy attained by the perfected meditator, Lord Krishna says that once the meditator gets this joy, he does not give any importance to any other joy in the world. The joy of meditation becomes paramount for him. Also, this joy protects the meditator from the shocks of worldly life. Having gained the joy of meditation, he does not get agitated by any sorrow whatsoever. Attainment of the joy in meditation does not mean that magically all our sorrows will vanish. Joy and sorrow will continue to exist until our human body exists. But meditation will give us an armor that will protect us from all worldly sorrows. The inner strength provided by meditation will enable us to stay calm even in the events of greatest sorrows. Further in 6.23 he says, You should know the definition of yoga as that which severs connection with sorrow. You should engage in yoga with firm conviction and a non-despondent mind. Lord Krishna motivates and inspires the meditator to attain perfection in meditation in the shloka. Only through meditation can a person completely sever all sorrows. He urges the meditator to follow the path of meditation with a firm and unwavering determination. No obstacles should deter the meditator from his goal. He further says that we must take a firm determination to attain the state of the perfected meditator. It is like a parent telling his child that he should focus on obtaining his graduate degree. It implies that the child will put effort in school, high school and college all the way until he gets his graduate degree. If each part of the curriculum is followed, the goal is attained easily. Knowing that this goal is not easy and is going to take a long time, Lord Krishna says that we should not let the mind become despondent. We may encounter obstacles in the way that may demotivate or frustrate us, but each time we encounter an obstacle that pushes us off the path of meditation, we must get up and continue again and again. In 624 he says, totally discarding all desires born out of thought projections, withdrawing the mind from sense objects everywhere. In this and the next shloka, Lord Krishna gives us a method for dealing with one of the biggest challenges in meditation, and that is uncontrolled desires. He says that in order to fulfill the goal of keeping the mind established in the self, we have to completely withdraw the mind from all sense objects and tackle desires at their root. 625 reads, with firm resolve and regularity, slowly but surely withdraw the mind through the intellect. Having established the mind in the self, do not think even a little bit about anything else. Here, Lord Krishna goes deeper into the topic of focusing attention on one thought. He says that the meditator should use his intellect to withdraw the mind from all material thoughts in order to focus the mind on one thought, and that is, I am the self. In the third chapter, we had encountered the hierarchy of our personality, where we saw that the mind is higher than the senses and the intellect is higher than the mind. It means that even though the mind is hard to control, our intellect has the power to control it. So the meditator should use the intellect to control the mind. Each time an unwanted thought comes, we should use the intellect to gently but firmly shift focus from that thought and put the mind back into the main thought of I am the self. This method could take weeks, months or even years. 
Therefore, he asks us to do it slowly, with great fortitude and patience. Each time the mind strays, we should not think that we have failed and get dejected. We should again bring the mind back slowly to the one main thought. In the next shlokas, he repeats the same thing established numerous times in previous shlokas. So 6.26 reads, Wherever the fickle and unstable mind strays, remove it from there and constantly focus it only on the self. Further, 6.27 reads, Supreme joy certainly obtains this yogi with serene mind, whose passion has been quietened, who has become the eternal essence, and who is without sin. Again, in 6.28 he says, In this manner, the sinless yogi always engaged in the self joyfully contacts the eternal essence, experiencing infinite bliss. With this shlok, the explanation of the process of meditation is concluded. Next, Lord Krishna illustrates the change in the vision of the meditator, which is the final topic in this chapter on meditation. So in verse number 29 he says, one who is established in yoga, one with equanimous vision everywhere, sees his self in all beings and all beings in his own self. Lord Krishna says that the perfected meditator sees his self in all beings and all beings in his self. It is difficult to comprehend this without actually practicing meditation. We can do our best to understand it through an example. Let's use the illustration of the wave and the ocean as our running example. As an individual, we have a name and a form. In the same way, we can assume that each wave in the ocean has a fictitious name and form. If we go with this analogy, then we can consider ourselves as one of those waves. Meditation enables us to expand the notion of what a wave is. So first we begin to see that although there are different kinds of waves in the ocean, in a sense, they are nothing but name and form. Some waves are big, some are small, some last for a few seconds and some last for a much longer time. Now, I could be a small wave and you could be a big wave, but both of us are waves nevertheless. This stage of the perfected meditator's vision is indicated by the verse, he sees his self in all beings. As we further expand our vision, we realize that all waves, no matter how big or small they are, they are contained within the same ocean. The ocean is infinitely larger than any of these waves. None of the waves can exist without the ocean. The final stage of this vision is reached when we as the wave realize that the ocean also is a name and form at its essence. It is nothing but water. I am the wave, but essentially I am water. Other waves are water as well and the ocean is also water. This state is indicated by the words, he sees all beings in his own self. And such a person is called Sarvatra Samadarshana, the one with equal vision. Drawing an analogy from the previous shloka, he further says in 6.30, one who sees me in all and sees all in me, to him I am not lost and he is not lost to me. This shloka can easily be understood as the preface was very well said in the explanation to the prior shloka. The analogy of a wave and the ocean can be applied to us and Ishwar respectively. So therefore, if we truly begin to think that the whole world comprises Ishwar in our chosen form, there will never be a single moment where we are far from Ishwar or Ishwar is far from us. In 31 he says, Established in oneness with me, one who beholds me as present in all beings, that yogi resides within me in all circumstances. Now, in order to emphasize the oneness of the individual with the Absolute, Lord Krishna says that the yogi who sees him present in all beings is always residing in him, no matter what circumstance the yogi finds himself in. In other words, the devotee does not lose his connection with Ishwar in any and all worldly and spiritual pursuits. First, let us refer back to our wave and ocean example to understand what is meant by oneness or ekatvam. 
if the wave sees himself as a part of the ocean and also sees the ocean waves as part of the ocean it ultimately realizes that everything is the ocean it realizes that there is no separation of wave and ocean and in doing so he attains oneness with the ocean similarly lord krishna says that the yogi who sees all beings in ishwar discards any thought of separation from ishwar he does attains oneness with ishwar he says that the yogi never loses this oneness it stays with him no matter what transaction he conducts in this world the yogi maintains an always on connection with ishwar he does not need to go on a pilgrimage or visit any specific temple because he is always connected to ishwar further he states in 6.32 by comparing himself to everything one who sees the same o arjun whether in joy or in sorrow such a yogi is considered supreme here lord krishna concludes his discourse on the topic of meditation he also summarizes the entire topic of meditation he says that one who sees himself in others and thus experiences their joys and sorrows becomes a yogi or a meditator of the highest caliber having received lord krishna's discourse on meditation arjun has several doubts about putting it into practice so he asks in 6.33 of this yoga of equanimity that you have spoken of o slayer of madhu i do not envision stability in that state due to the fickle nature of the mind arjun states that it is difficult for someone to maintain a vision of equanimity because the untrained mind will not allow it it may be possible to develop that vision for a few seconds maybe for a few minutes but not more than that moreover it is difficult to see one's own self in someone we hate or dislike if we try to see ourselves in such a person the mind quickly changes the thought from i am the self of that person to he did a bad thing to me last year he continues to elaborate on this question in the next shloka and he says for the mind is fickle rebellious strong and stubborn o krishna to control it i think is as arduous as the wind arjun says that the mind is as difficult to control as trying to harness the wind as it is fickle rebellious strong and stubborn it will refuse any attempt to be controlled lord krishna had acknowledged the fickle nature of the mind in previous shlokas so we ourselves have directly experienced how fickle our mind is most of the time our mind is jumping from one thought to another how we can also tell how fickle someone's mind is by observing their eyes if they dart around too much it means that their mind is racing through thoughts arjun also says that the mind is pramathi it is difficult to exactly translate this word the closest word could be rebellious it is like a wild horse that is being tamed for the first time it will never let the rider stay on its back for more than a few seconds trying to control the mind becomes a wrestling match where the opponent does not let us get a good grip on him furthermore arjun refers to the mind as strong and stubborn in other words once the mind is made up or the mind has decided that it wants a certain thing it is very hard to change it it is like a child throwing a tantrum it will cry yell and scream till it gets its way the mind will resist all efforts to be controlled and will start creating a list of desires which will throw us completely off track so therefore he sums up the difficulty of controlling the mind by comparing his endeavor to taming the wind something that is next to impossible so lord krishna replies to this and in 6.35 he says indeed the mind is hard to restrain and fickle o kontey but through constant discipline and dispassion it can be controlled lord krishna agreed that the mind is hard to restrain but he also said that it can be controlled through constant discipline and dispassion he provided a two pronged approach to controlling the mind and in doing so he summarized the entire spiritual technique of the bhagavad gita first let us look at discipline or abhyas as i said in the words it is the technique of constant hearing 
contemplation and internalization of knowledge, which in Sanskrit is Shravanam, Mananam and Nidityasana. Due to ignorance inherent in human nature, we forget our true self and think that we are this infinite body, mind and intellect. We need to continually hear the knowledge of the eternal essence to remove this ignorance. But even before we can reach a stage where we can hear such knowledge, we first need to clear our minds of impurities in the form of selfish desires and the notion of doership and enjoyership. But this is not enough. We need to practice this passion, meaning we have to give up our attachment to people, objects and situations so that our mind stops becoming agitated. This can only happen when we stop and check the mind each time it rushes out into the world and examine whether we will truly get joy through the object that the mind gets. Further in 636 he says, Yoga is inaccessible for one with an uncontrolled mind. This is my opinion. But for one with a controlled mind who strives diligently, it is possible to attain. In order to emphasize the point he made in the previous verse, Lord Krishna says that a person who is not in control of his mind cannot ever attain the state of the meditator. Moreover, he advises Arjun to put forth tons of efforts, but to do so dexterously and intelligently. Note that he does not issue any order. He says that this is his opinion, take it or leave it. Arjun asks in 6.37, The unsuccessful seeker, endowed with faith, whose mind deviates from yoga and has not attained perfection in yoga, what is his situation, O Krishna? Here Arjun asks another question, What happens when a seeker is striving to meditate faithfully and diligently, but is unable to reach the state of the perfected meditator in his lifetime? And he continues in the next shloka, Unsuccessful in both ways, with no worldly glory, distracted in the spiritual path, doesn't the seeker get destroyed like a scattered cloud, O mighty aunt? Arjun wanted Sri Krishna to tell him that if someone follows the spiritual path but is not able to attain fulfillment, wouldn't he end up in a situation where he sees himself as a loser from both the sides? Arjun uses the analogy of a cloud that neither provides rain, nor does it vanish. This in-between situation makes it an easy target for winds to scatter the cloud from one place to another. Further in 39 he says, To dispel this doubt of mine, O Krishna, only you are worthy. For other than you, no one is fit to dispel this doubt. To this Lord Krishna replies in 640 and he says, O Parth, Neither here nor there does his destruction ever happen, for whoever performs virtuous acts does not go into distress, my dear. Lord Krishna responds by unequivocally asserting that nothing harmful or distressful will happen to the meditator while he is in this world or any other world. In fact, he will attain a better state, both from a material as well as spiritual standpoint. We have to carefully understand the meaning of Shri Krishna's words. He is in no way implying that the meditator will somehow attain material success due to his meditation. The common standard for attaining success in our world is wealth, power and fame, none of which is guaranteed as a result of meditation. He wants us to understand that one who takes up meditation sincerely will automatically develop dispassion towards wealth, power and fame. He will not care whether he attains material success or not. So therefore a lack of material success will not cause him distress. But that does not mean that the meditator obtains a pitiable state. In fact, by sincerely practicing meditation, the seeker will be in tune and in harmony with the world. Then the world itself will take care of all the seeker's needs. Next, he addresses the second part of Arjun's question, which is, what happens to the meditator when he dies before gaining perfection in meditation? So he says in 641, Obtaining those worlds destined for performance of virtuous deeds and residing there for several years, 
that one who has fallen from yoga is born in the home of the pure and illustrious. Here he says that such a meditator attains heaven, and having stayed there for a longer period of time, he is born into an illustrious family. Many of us try to perform meritorious acts or punya throughout our life, and at the same time try to avoid or minimize demerits or pap. The difference between pap and punya determines our fate after death. Those that have an excess of punya go to heaven after death. Others go to hell. So Sri Krishna says that one who follows the path of meditation is automatically qualified to access the very same heaven that is attained by people who have performed immeasurable meritorious acts. He does not have to worry about counting merits and demerits. He just has to continue meditating. Now, no matter how much pleasure it gives, the stay in heaven is always temporary. Once the allotted time runs out, the unfulfilled meditator will have to come back into the world. But it will not be such a bad thing. He will attain an environment that is conducive for continuing his spiritual journey. Lord Krishna says that such a person will be born into an illustrious family. One that is endowed not only with material wealth, but also spiritual prowess. Why should such a family need to have material wealth? The primary reason for the meditator to remain unfulfilled is that he still carries around traces of material desire. The new family that he is born into will give him the opportunity to get those material desires out of his system. As we have seen earlier, perfect meditation is possible only when material desires are addressed holistically. Many of us may not be able to digest the notion of heaven and rebirth. In any case, Lord Krishna wants us to assure us that the very laws of nature that take care of the meditator while he is alive will ensure that he will be taken care of even after death. In 6.42 he says, Alternatively, he will go only to a family of learned yogis. One whose birth is of this type is exceedingly rare in this world. Here he speaks about the meditators who are on an advanced stage as compared to the ones he talked about in the previous shlok. He says, The other rarer category of meditator had managed to extinguish his desires, but could not attain liberation because he ran out of time. Since he is not interested in fulfilling any desire, regardless of whether it is heavenly or earthly, he goes straight into a family of yogis after he dies. These yogis are not just accomplished meditators, they also possess dhimat or a keen understanding of scriptures. Such a family provides a conducive environment for this kind of meditator to continue his progress in meditation. He has enough dispassion in him and therefore does not get affected by the absence of wealth in his new family. In fact, he appreciates it because wealth can become a distraction in the path of meditation. So further enlisting the benefits, he says in 6.43, there he regains connection with the intellect of his prior birth. And using that, he again strives for liberation, O oh joy of the Kurus. He now says that the ones that are born into the yogic family reconnect with their intellect from their prior birth. In other words, their effort in their previous life does not go waste. 6.44 he says, though helpless, he is pushed due to his prior effort because even the seeker of yoga transcends the words of Brahma. Here he describes the fate of the other type of unfulfilled meditator who is born into a prosperous family. Sri Krishna says that even though such a person will indulge in sense pleasures, his previous efforts will push him towards rekindling his spiritual journey. This attraction or push towards spirituality will give him the potential of transcending his material pleasures. So therefore it is incumbent upon all spiritual seekers to continuously strive towards attaining their spiritual goals, no matter what their history is. Lord Krishna speaks more about this determination and effort in the next shloka and he says, For that yogi who strives diligently, whose sins have been purified, 
perfected through many births, he then attains the supreme state. Here he talks about what happens to a person if he strives diligently. He says he acquires spiritual prowess over many lives, purifies his sins, and ultimately attains the ultimate state of liberation. Now the plight of someone born into a prosperous family, yet as being pulled towards spirituality, is extremely interesting. On one hand, his family wealth has the potential for generating further selfish desires. On the other hand, the push towards the spiritual path has the potential of taking him towards liberation. What will decide his fate in regards to which side he ends up on is nothing but his effort and his diligence. Therefore, Lord Krishna encourages Arjun to relentlessly pursue his path. Arjun is born into one of the most illustrious families of his time. But through the knowledge that he is receiving from Krishna, he has the option of pursuing the spiritual path, but only if he incorporates his teachings into his life. So further in 646, he says, The yogi is greater than men of austerity, even greater than men of knowledge, and greater than men of action, therefore become a yogi, O Arjun. Lord Krishna begins to conclude the topic of meditation with the shlok. Having described the need for meditation, the definition of meditation, the process of meditation and the fate of a meditator, he now positions meditation as the ultimate means of attaining liberation. He says that the yogi or the meditator is superior to people who practice austerities, work selflessly or study the scriptures. And regardless of how much spiritual progress has been made in prior births, meditation is the only means of liberation. That is why he urges Arjun to follow the path of meditation. In the last shlok he says, Even among the yogis endowed with faith, one who worships me with his mind fully absorbed in me, he is the most fit in my opinion. Here, Krishna says that we should develop the highest possible ideal to whom we can dedicate all our worldly actions. But this ideal should not just be an intellectual ideal. Unless our hearts are filled with devotion towards this ideal, our attempts will be lacking. But we need to strike a balance. Emotion without intellect results in superstition. Intellect without emotion results in fanaticism. Both are ill-advised. We need a combination of the two. We also need the ideal to be tangible and real, not something that is extremely difficult for our mind to grasp. Therefore, the concluding message of this chapter to Arjun and to us is to develop devotion. Devotion will ensure that we remain connected to Ishwar. In order to do so, we first need to understand who Ishwar is. Where is he located? What are his accomplishments? How can we access him? And so on. Only then can we truly develop devotion. This concludes the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. The links to the other chapters have been provided in the description box. Hit the like button if you like the explanation. Consider subscribing to our channel Om Dharma and share the video with the loved ones. Peace.